want to talk today about how our senses work together. You're probably wondering about that topic, but you're probably also wondering what a philosopher could probably could tell you about it. Philosophers, after all, just sit in their rooms and think. Uh, they, they don't have expensive machinery, and they don't even have dogs, as Julie told us before. <laughs> so how can a philosopher tell you anything about the senses? Well, I'm going to try to persuade you that we have something to say, or at least something to ask. And I will take you through a story that starts about 900 years ago and ends up with me. Uh, that's just a bit egotistical, but I'll <laughs> tell you that anyway. OK, so here's the philosopher's question. How do we know what it is, whatever it is that we know? So we can all disagree about whether we know a particular thing, but a philosopher wants to know how do you know that? And asking that simple question can give you quite productive results, as we'll see. So before I take you on this story, let me first uh, just describe what it is that I want to talk about. So here's a photograph of me with my fingers on my keyboard, and uh, I can feel the index finger on the J. Well, I can feel the index finger on a key. I can also see the finger on the keyboard. Now, uh, if you were looking over my shoulder, you too would see the finger on the keyboard or on the J, but you wouldn't, obviously, feel my finger, or you might if you touched it, but you wouldn't feel my finger on the keyboard. So seeing or vision is in some sense from the outside, whereas touching or feeling is from the inside, and you can't feel exactly what I feel in my fingers. Here we have um, what you might call a multiplex experience. We have the, the touch, the sight, in addition, I'll be concentrating on those, but in addition, I might hear the click. Uh, I might be able to feel the control in my fingers. All of these things melt together into one single big complex experience. And my question, as the philosopher goes, is how does it do that? So we have many senses working together. So let's go to just two of them, seeing and touching. And as I've said before, I have a uh, duplex experience of this, uh, something which sight and touch both combine to give some sort of complex experience, whereas you, looking over my shoulder, have a simplex experience, namely just the vision. And so something special is going on in me, and I want to know how that happens. So the question is, how do I match sense and touch? OK, so here's one answer. The answer is, uh, and here's where the philosophy gets kind of slightly complex. There's a bit of text involved here. The answer goes like this. I know by touch that something or the other is touching my index finger. Right? I obviously don't know that it's a J. Uh, I know by seeing that something or the other is touching the J. Now here comes a crucial point. I remember, because I've done it, I've seen it before, what my index finger looks like. And so I recognize the thing that's touching the J as my index finger. So I have, as it were, a bridge between what I see and what I feel. And that bridge is simply the prior knowledge of what my index finger looks like. So two simplex experiences and a bridge gives me a duplex experience. That's the idea that some people have put forward. The philosopher wants to know how I know. And so the philosopher asks a very simple question. Suppose I didn't know what my index finger looks like. Now that sounds absurd, but suppose 
I had up to this moment been blind and had only just begun to see what would happen then. Obviously, I wouldn't know what my index finger looks like. So that's an example of a philosophical, what we call a thought experiment. It's a thought experiment because it doesn't require a lab. It just does require somebody sitting in their armchair thinking. So that question about the blind person who just began to see was asked by a person called Ibn Tufel, who was a philosopher in Muslim Spain back in Andalusia back in the 12th century. Uh, he was a very fine philosopher, though he had the misfortune that both his teacher, Ibn Bajaj, Ibn Bajai, I beg your pardon, and his student, Ibn Rushd, were both much more famous than he was. Still, he was a famous person. He was a, a vizier, prominent public servant, very learned. And he asked the following question. He said, suppose, think of a man blind, but of quick parts. By quick parts, he means very intelligent. And he knew the names and the descriptions of the colors. Then he has his eyes opened, by which he means by his sight is restored to him, or he, get, he begins to see. And he asks, would he then be able to recognize the colors? Does the man, blind, blind man have pre-sighted knowledge of the colors through these descriptions and definitions that were given to him? Amazingly enough, he conjectures, yes. So he says something like, when the blind man newly begins to see, he would be, see the colors with greater clarity, and he'd be extremely delighted by what he saw, but he would be able to recognize these colors right away. So no bridge needs to be built. And that's a little bit of a head scratcher, because look at these two colors, blue and red, and imagine yourself trying to describe them to somebody who is blind in such a way that when the blind person began to see, they would then be able to tell which one of these is blue and which one of these is red. It's very difficult to figure out what you would say. You can't say something like, it's the same color as a bus, because obviously the person has never seen a bus. What would you say? Uh, yet Ibn Tufel thought, yes, you could say something that would help. So no bridge is needed, according to him. Now, that was in the 12th century. And as happens very often in philosophy, a very long time goes by. But 500 years later, in the late 17th century, suddenly his book is translated into Latin. And it kind of catches fires in, in as much as anything could catch fire back in the 17th century without Twitter. It was translated three times in the space of just about 40 years. Um, and it was widely read, and people discussed it. And it may have been, may very well have been read by this man, William Molyneux, who um, read, led a short but incredibly productive life in Dublin, Ireland at the end of the 17th um, century. Molyneux was a lawyer. He, at the age of 21, married somebody who almost immediately became sick and started to go blind. So he and his wife led a rather lonely life, and he re-educated himself as an engineer and a mathematician and a philosopher, and not surprisingly, was very interested in blindness. He wrote to John Locke in 1688. John Locke was probably the second most best English philosopher of all time. Um, you can ask me later if you meet me in the lobby who is the best. But um, he puts to Locke a purely hypothetical case. And the purely hypothetical case goes like this. A man born blind who can distinguish between a globe and a cube by touch. So it's not like Ibn Tufel's description. He actually knows the globe and the cube by touch. Has um, 
his sight restored to him. That's the Ibn Tufel experiment. And the question is, can he tell by sight alone which is the globe and which is the cube when it's put in front of him? So uh, an experiment which is somewhat different from Ibn Tufel's because the person already knows the globe and the cube. You might think that the problem's a little easier than the one that Ibn Tufel put about the colors, and that's because a cube has faces, edges, points, and you might think that by touching those, you'd be able to tell um, there's something unsymmetrical about a cube, whereas a globe is perfectly symmetrical from all sides, nothing like that, um, and maybe that would help. No said Locke and Molyneux. It would not help. It would not help because Locke and Molyneux thinks that the only way you can look, tell what a globe or a cube looks like or what a face or an edge or a point looks like is by seeing it. That's it. They're completely dogmatic about that fact. OK, so there's a second thought experiment and a second answer. There's sort of an opposite view to Ibn Tufel, even on an easier case. Finally, 40 years later, in 1728, um, some facts begin to emerge. This is a picture of William Cheseldon, who pioneered some surgery. He was so great at it that he could do some gallbladder surgery, and the mortality rate, his mortality rate was as low as 50%. <laughs> he managed to restore the sight of a 13-year-old boy by removing his opaque cataracts. No anesthetics. But the boy could then be asked a simple question. He could be asked Molyneux's question. Can you tell the difference between a globe and a cube? Turns out that the boy could not. Uh, he could form no judgment of their shape. He knew not the shape of anything. But he was very eager to learn. It, everything looked really weird to him. He couldn't tell how far anything was, how close anything was, what shape anything was, but he could learn. So it looked like the bridge had to be constructed. It looked like Molyneux and Locke were correct, and Ibn Tufel was completely wrong, even about the somewhat easier case that we're describing. Well, about 15 years ago, an MIT cognitive scientist by the name of Pavan Sinha decided that he would test this whole thing. And he got a grant from the United States National Institutes of Health Research to restore the sight of a large number of young adults and adolescents in Delhi, in India. Ostensibly to, to test Molyneux's problem, but in fact, some thousands of people had their sight restored, so it did a lot more than that. Pavan Sinha found that these people could not, in fact, recognize shapes right away. So it looked like Cheseldon had been vindicated, and in turn, Locke and Molyneux had been vindicated, and that uh, Ibn Tufel was completely wrong. By the way, Pavan Sinha gave a TED talk, and you can look it up because he has a very interesting take on this problem, which I won't go into here. So where are we? Can the blind man know about the things that the sighted see? And there are three answers that we've looked at. Ibn Tufel says, yes, everything. Right? They can even know the colors. Then there's this intermediate answer, which we've just sort of floated, which says, um, not the colors, but maybe the shapes. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, the, this whole slew of people, Molyneux, Locke, Cheseldon, and Sinha, and they all say, no, nothing. Nothing would he be able to recognize by sight alone without, of course, learning it first. Back to the finger on the J. Molyneux and Locke and Cheseldon and Sinha think that multiplex experience depends on building a bridge and that the newly sighted person would not. So you see how this thought experiment has come into the 18th um, century with, um, or in fact, into the 21st century with St. Pavan Sinha with some experimentation. But um, that's where um, my investigation begins. I want to perform the last and third thought experiment. The question about the finger on the J 
is in my observation, there's a slight red herring in what was proposed before. The red herring was that you had to know something about the shape of the index finger. But wait a minute, that problem is not a problem about shape, really. It's about position, right? The question is, um, there's something, here's my finger, here's another finger touching it, and there it is, and I feel something at the end of my finger. Now here I still feel something at the end of my finger, but it's somewhere else in my visual field. The question is, can I match this feel at the end of my finger to this position in my visual field? Can I do that? Uh, I feel something here, I feel something there. Is here equal to there or here not equal to there? So can I match the here's of vision and the there's of touch uh, without some learning and without constructing a bridge? And that's my new thought experiment. So here is a way that one might test it. And I want you just to think about it because this is something that as far as I know has never been done. I wrote an email to Pavan Sinha, he didn't reply, so there you go. I don't know what the answer is. So here's a newly sighted patient sitting in a dark room and a light is switched on. Person doesn't know, has, so up to now has seen absolutely nothing from the left or the right. Would that person be able to point to the light? That's the question that I want to know without any help of touch or control or anything. Actually, we do have some, we do have some newly sighted people in this world, and we can not ask them, but we can observe them. They are newly sighted. In fact, I have a new grandchild who was born yesterday. <laughs> but they pass the test. When you touch, a newborn or even present something that's of interest to them, like food, <laughs> they can look towards it or they can, they can indicate that they've seen something. So they have what I might actually call a triplex experience. They feel, they turn, they look, and um, they do this right from the moment that they are born. So, um, Ibn Tufel's question 900 years ago was thought to be settled against him, but there's a very much more simple thing that can be done. How much do newborns know when they are born? Maybe we know even things like position independently of touch or sight. Okay, so three thought experiments. There was Ibn Tufel's on colors, Molyneux's on shapes, and the one that I proposed on spatial location each of these touches on something about how the senses work together. Thank you.